Welcome to Electronic Configuration for Normal Humans. And what the goal is today is to try to make sure that everybody understands things that look like this, which look like the nightmare of some ninth grade algebra student, or diagrams like this, uh, which just look like strange diagrams. But what we're actually up to is explaining a accounting system for electrons, basically how we keep up with electrons and atoms, what electron is where, and you know what the place, places of other electrons, and, and how we know and how we're able to tell. And that's pretty much the goal today. If you understand this diagram here, which you might see on the whiteboard of a veterinary hospital, then you understand essentially what we're trying to do with electron configuration. It probably doesn't take much of a rocket scientist to figure out that this means that in this veterinary hospital, we've got eight dogs on board and there are six cats. And again, that's essentially the goal is just to keep up with stuff. Obviously, these are not dogs and these are not cats, but we use that to keep up with dogs and cats. But even as simple as it is, uh, there's always a way to screw something up. Uh, so, for example, if you did something like this, if you saw somebody doing something like this, uh, you'd stop and wonder, you know, what the heck are they talking about? Is this supposed to be a five? Is it a four or whatever? So when you're using a system of keeping up with things, you obviously have to follow the rules in order for people to understand what the heck you're talking about. Uh, so, you know, otherwise you're going to leave people confused. Okay, well, uh, what I want to do just real briefly is look back on what we all learned about electrons in elementary school. And it was natural enough for the scientists that first discovered the nucleus back in the 1900s to model that on uh, the solar system. This is a model of stars, of uh, planets going around stars. And so naturally enough, they came up with a model looking somewhat similar to that at first in the uh, early 1900s. And now we know that it's a bit more complicated. And so the little dot there represents the nucleus of an atom. And believe it or not, it is drawn entirely too large, but we need to be able to see it. So instead of electrons going around in specific orbits, they are found in what are called orbitals, which is the region of space where it's highly likely to find an electron. This is the 1s orbital, meaning it's in the first energy level, what's called an energy level. And it's s, it's spherical. Anyway, so around uh, a nucleus of an atom, you're going to find the 1s orbital, and only the 1s orbital is going to be occupied in the smaller atoms. As you get bigger, you're going to find another s. It's going to be in the second energy level. And then things start to get unusual with what are called the p orbitals in the second energy level. Uh, and there's one p in the x uh, axis, along the x axis. There's one p along the y, and then there's one p along the z. And each one of these orbitals, um, the S's, and then the, uh, the X, the Y, and the Z, all of those will contain two electrons each, or a maximum of two electrons each. Then we'll go out further, and this is the last one we're going to look at, even though there are a lot more uh, will be on top of that. It's a 3S, so it's in the third energy level, and it's the S orbital. Obviously, it's, it would be a little bit difficult to sketch these every time you needed to you know, talk about these things. But uh, what we're going to do, again, is talk about this system we use for keeping track of them. So uh, just briefly, each orbital is associated with a different part of the periodic table. If it has its upper electrons in an S orbital, it's going to be found in that part of the table called the S block. The P's are going to be found in what is called the P block. And there's another set we haven't seen yet called the D's. Uh, those will be found in what's called the D block. And then the F's are going to be found in the F block. And we'll talk about each of these in a, in a bit of detail. All right, so we're getting down now to how we are actually going to keep up with all these things. We do so in part by the use of what's called an alphabet diagram. And so instead of drawing these uh, orbitals like they have them go through the trouble of drawing these orbitals like this, we just use boxes. It's a whole lot easier just to draw a box. Um, and it says uh, you, you have a, a, each one has a maximum of two electrons with opposite spin, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, drawn as arrows. So um, also you've got the energy levels here and here will also correspond to the periods on the, er on the periodic table. So the first energy level corresponds to the first period. The second energy level here corresponds to the second. All right? And we start keeping up with these electrons uh, using uh, one of the rules that's called the off-ball principles, where the electrons will enter the lowest energy level first. So there's our first electron. 
And so, wow, without even knowing it, we've figured out the electron configuration for hydrogen. Since there's only one electron, there's not very much to keep up with, but we've got one electron in the S orbital. And if we don't want to have to go through the trouble of doing a whole off bar diagram, all we have to do is write 1s1. That is the electron configuration for hydrogen. Um, and if it's a completely legitimate test question would be, uh, what's the electron configuration for hydrogen? That's the answer. What this shows is um, the, the big one out front is basically showing the first energy level, that it's in the first energy level. Uh, it also corresponds to the first period on the periodic table, the entire period all the way across. Uh, that's what that's referring to. Uh, the S right behind it, uh, the electron is in an S orbital, as you see. And uh, in on the periodic table, this means that it's located over here on the S block on the, on the left-hand side. And it's pretty much just that simple. Now, the only thing left is the little one up here, which means it's just one electron uh, that is in the S orbital. It's just that simple, All right? So uh, now we need to talk just about uh, a little bit about the Pauli, what's called the Pauli ex exclusion principle, where it says an atomic orbital can have a maximum of two electrons, and there's the second one, uh, and they must have opposite spins. Now, the word spin in quantum mechanics is not exactly the same as it is in the large scale world, but we don't have to make a huge differentiation in order to figure out how to do electron configurations. It can be thought of as being clockwise and counterclockwise, and it's indicated by the up arrow and the down arrow. And that's really about all we need to know uh, for that. But anyway, if we have uh, two electrons in the first uh, S, the 1S, uh, that means that is helium. That is the electron configuration for helium. Uh, this it describes where both of its electrons are. And it's located uh, over here. Now, helium is the only one with the uh, electrons in the upper electrons in the S that's not over here in this S block. And that is for reasons that are a little bit outside the scope of what we're doing right now. But so we're just going to pass over that for now. But anyway, uh, it, the 1s2 basically describes all the electrons for helium. That's the bottom line. So now we're going to add more, one more electron and see what happens there. See up on the top, on the left hand side, that's the electron configuration for lithium. And lithium is right there. Uh, and you see it's 1s2, 2s. One, right. So this means that we've got to keep up with all the lower level electrons every time we do an electron configuration. Sometimes that's a little bit of a pain in the butt, but that's that's those are the rules. So anyway, just like with the other uh, configurations we've seen, the big two out front uh, indicates it's the second energy level, and it corresponds to the second period on the periodic table. Um, also, the S right behind it just as uh, with the uh, lower ones that we've done. The S indicates that it's in an S orbital. And uh, the superscript here, the one, indicates that there's one electron in that orbital. All right. So now we add yet another electron, and it's not going to be probably that much of a shock uh, to figure out that it's going to be the next one is beryllium, and it's that it's 1s2, 2s2. So you just basically just keep on in that pattern. Now, we haven't done the P's yet, but those are those are coming up and not that terribly different. All right, those, there's the P's, uh, the, the P block on the periodic table. The next, we're gonna, the next one we're going to do is boron, and predictably enough, boron is right there. It's 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Um, now, on the next electron we add, we've got to take something into consideration. Do we add the electron right here, or do we add it in one of these two? Because, you know, there's one of the other places. You, you've got to add it one place or the other. And, you know, there's probably got to be a rule with it, and there is. It turns out that in a sublevel with multiple orbitals, this is Hund's rule, all the orbitals are occupied with single electrons before they're paired. So you can't add an electron here before you fill these guys up. Right? And that's Hund's rule. So when you do that, that's the electron configuration for carbon. Right. So um, then uh, we look at the next one. We add one more electron, and that's going to be nitrogen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Uh, and once we get those filled up, then we can start pairing the electrons up. So the next one that we do after nitrogen is going to be oxygen. And you see here, that that's where we start pairing uh, the electrons. Uh, so, 
Uh, after that, after oxygen, we'll do fluorine. And fluorine is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Uh, just intermittently calling out the electron configurations on given ones. Uh, and again, that's fluorine. And then lastly on this row is neon, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Now we're up to the third energy level. And so we have an extra electron there. And that extra electron makes sodium, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. And if you're wondering if people get tired of rattling off numbers and s's and p's and more numbers, and if they instead use some sort of shortcut, the answer is yes. And we're about to cover that uh, just shortly. But anyway, for now we have sodium and we're going to add a few more. Uh, we're not going to name off every one, but we start filling up the P's. And just as before with the P's, we follow Hund's rule and we uh, we don't pair them until, until we absolutely have to. This last one that we added is phosphorus, which is right there, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. So that last one is the third uh, electron. Then we'll add a couple of more, which will take us out all the way out to the end, which is argon, which ends in 3s2, 3p6. I won't rattle all the rest of that off, which actually introduces the next part. I mentioned that sodium, when we were talking about that, about you know if there's a shortcut or not, and it turns out there is. Instead of having to rattle off 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1 for sodium, hopefully everybody would agree that uh, the Notation 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 actually spells out neon. All right, that's the electron configuration for neon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So instead of writing the entire thing out, the idea is you just put neon in brackets and then include the rest that's unique to sodium. So it would be just neon and then 3s1. Same way with phosphorus. We've got right here, this is the electronic electron configuration for neon. So all we have to do is put neon and then 3s2, 3p3, which is the part that's unique uh, to phosphorus. Same thing for argon. We have the electron configuration for neon right there. So we just write it down that way and then write out the part that's unique uh, for argon, 3s2, 3p6. So that turns out to be a fairly handy uh, shortcut. Okay, for the first time we're seeing the D sublevel now, the D orbitals. Uh, right here and I need to point out something fairly important here most of the time we've been able to sort of use the periodic table as a as a cheat sheet for how to fill in our electrons on our uh, electron configurations because of the fact that the energy levels here correlate with the numbers of the periods over here well with the D's it's not going to the 3D the corresponding level on the periodic table is here in the fourth period so when we're naming these off, you, the temptation might be to say 4D, blah, 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 when in fact it's actually going to be 3D. Then the next level down, instead of being 5D, it's going to be 4D, and on and on. That's the only thing you really need to keep in mind at this point to kind of help you out in remembering uh, you know, how to fill these in and, and also kind of being able to use the periodic table as a cheat sheet for helping you with electron configurations. When we continue, the electrons will start filling in here at 4S, but, but after we fill up the 4s, they're going to go to the 3d because that's uh, at a lower energy than the 4p, as you can tell on the outbound di diagram. So again, that's about the only thing you really need to keep in mind that's different uh, to help you with these electron configurations. So adding the first electron to the fourth energy level, that gives us potassium, which is spelled out in its entirety there. And everybody is a lot happier just by saying, argon 4s1. Uh, so this will be a lot less tedious uh, this way. And the uh, potassium is obviously located right there. I'm going to skip over a few until we get to the D's. And the first one in the D's is scanium, which is right there. Of course, the D's being located right there. Uh, argon 4s2 and then 3d1. You know, it, it just you're going along in the same sort of patterns as you have before. So we're not going to tediously do every single one, but we'll stop at key points, add a few more electrons, and we're going through these uh, elements that are listed right here until we get to, we're going to get to the fifth 
uh, electron in the Ds, and that's manganese, argon, and then uh, 4s2, and then 3d5. All right. Okay, it's right there. All right, we'll add a few more, and we'll take it all the way out to the end this time in order to avoid going through every single one. The last one is zinc. That's argon, 4s2, 3d10. Now, we skipped over some things in the Ds where there are some exceptions to some rules that we're going to cover a little bit later. But for the most part, you got the big picture uh, on the Ds. All right, we're going to do the, the remaining Ps now. Uh, we're going to, again, we're going to skip a few just to sample some representative uh, samples here. Add a few more electrons till we come out to uh, 4P3, and that's going to be arsenic. So arsenic is uh, AR4S2, 3D10, 4P3, which is located right there. All right. We add some more just to take it all the way out to the end. When we stop on the end, that's going to be krypton, which is AR4S2, 3D10, 4P6. And it's right there. So th that's the big picture on electron configuration.